فعاش القلب إخلاصا وافر تتحومك الطير تحلق في ثقافات وتنهل من روبا الخير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his household, his companions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and bless every one of us. And may Allah reward you for the fact that you have come here in great numbers, seated, mashallah, from a while, waiting for us. And I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me this opportunity to actually be with you. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us success in the dunya and the akhirah. Amen. My brothers and sisters, have you ever thought about why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created so many creatures besides mankind? If you look at creation, mankind was not the first of all creation to be brought onto the earth, but instead there were other creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that were created and they have existed and they are around us. Why would Allah do that? Many of us, we enjoy the greenery. We look at the animals. We love to go out in the safaris. And we enjoy looking at the different creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of them dangerous, some of them not so dangerous. We want to have some pets as well. Have we ever thought, why did Allah make those animals? Why are some of these animals halal, some of them haram to consume? Even if you were to slaughter them in the proper way, in the halal way, these animals, some of them can never be halal because a, a pig, for example, no matter how many times you say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, you will never be able to consume that pork or the flesh of a swine. Have you thought of why? Why did Allah create a snake that is so dangerous and a lion that subhanallah, whilst it looks quite good, whilst it actually attracts people, whilst it can become a source of income because of those who love to go and see and enjoy and whatever else you have, subhanallah, it is a dangerous animal and you cannot consume it. Then have you thought about the other creatures of Allah, some trees, are quite dangerous. Do you know that? Have you thought about why Allah creates the other trees? You know, not very far from my house, on the road as I'm leaving my home every morning, I see some trees. And I notice that once in the year, the trees blossom. I'm sure you know what jacaranda is. You must be having it here too, right? The jacaranda, back at home, blossoms once a year and just after it there is another tree that blossoms with a beautiful orange color lovely and i look at it and i tell myself why did allah make this tree and why is it that it only blossoms once a year why why do you have mango trees that only give you fruit once or twice in the year and why do you have a season for every fruit why did allah do that why do we have regions where it's very hot and humid such as mombasa for example although i'm feeling the coolness coming from everyone here mashallah you know, they told me we will put a fan on the right and a fan on the left, mashallah. I saw the brothers on the right and the sisters on the left and the coolness just started coming through, alhamdulillah. I saw my colleague who is the MC here, he had a towel in his hand and he came in for two minutes and I saw him wipe his forehead with a towel. Immediately, I decided to take out my tissues, put them in order. Put in my and I said I'll put it because I don't want to be I did not bring a towel but inshallah I hope I won't use this by the will of Allah but why did Allah create this why why has Allah made diverse colors diverse colors how come you cannot look into the sun but you can look into the moon have you thought of this Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa akhtilafi al-layli wa al-nahar wa al-nahari la ayatin li ulil al-bab 
الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار Amazing description by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and amazing how Allah says those who truly believe in Allah they are the ones who will consider the movement of the day and the night the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everything that Allah has made they will ponder deeply over it in order to recognize the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to understand the plan of Allah for us if you don't know the plan of Allah you will never understand your purpose on earth you need to ask yourself and think about it carefully why did Allah make a snake subhanallah why did Allah create a crocodile for what it's a dangerous animal how many have lost their lives due to crocodiles how many have lost their lives due to some other creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why you must be wondering please speak about your topic it is building bridges subhanallah right well this introduction is absolutely important you will never ever be able to understand what is your purpose on earth and you will not be able to understand how to respect differences if you don't know the beauty of the difference not starting with human beings but before humankind came onto the earth don't we believe we were created by Allah for Allah to test us in order to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Listen to what Allah says in Surah Al-Mulk. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْنُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ Allah says, it is He who created death and life in order that the minute he says in order that he is explaining to you the purpose of creation why did he make you in order to test you in order to test me so you mean I'm on earth so that Allah tests me test me with what why should Allah test me yesterday someone asked me a question from Europe the question was if Allah knew that we are going to heaven and hell and if Allah has determined the whole future why did he make us why didn't he just put us where we were belonging in the first place so I told him I said when you have a court case, is it fair for the judge to just say, right, I'm jailing you without proving you or to you the evidence? You did this, you did that, you did this. Look at what you did. The evidence is against you. You now deserve this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not impose on us certain matters. He has given us a choice regarding you are sitting here. It was in the knowledge of Allah. It was decreed by Allah indeed. But he gave you the capacity and the choice. Subhanallah. He will not punish you for what you did not have a choice regarding. If something happened beyond your choice, say for example, something disastrous happened. You were driving according to the speed limits and suddenly someone decided to break the limits or to, they made a mistake. They bumped into you and you were injured. You are not going to be asked, why were you injured? That man is going to be asked, why were you driving recklessly? So that was not in your capacity. It's qadr. It taqdeer meaning it is destiny. It was destined that I was going to go through this. Indeed, I had no role to play. Allah will not question me where I didn't have a choice. But where Allah has given you a choice, you chose. Allah holds you responsible. That does not mean he doesn't know what was going to happen. This is why when we talk about the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many of you would obviously know I'm just repeating it. The knowledge of Allah encompasses many aspects to show the greatness of Allah. Allah knows the past. He knows the past. Yakunu is mudara in the Arabic language. It is present and future. So Allah knows the past. He knows the present and he knows the future. But there is something more than that that Allah knows. 
which is amazing. Allah knows that which was not going to happen and will not happen. If it were to happen, how it would have happened? Allah knows it already. Can I give you an example from the Quran? In Surah Al-Kahf, and I'm sure we read it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about certain incidents that happened between Musa alayhi salam and Al-Khidr. Al-Khidr. And Allah speaks about one of them where a young boy was killed by Al-Khidr. And Musa alayhi salam says, أَقَتَلْتَ نَفْسًا زَكِيَّةً بِغَيْرِ نَفْسِ How can you kill this man without any reason? No purpose. We are not allowed to kill just because you might have had a disagreement or a difference. You have no right to take away the life that Allah gave. Who gave life? Allah. How can you take away life that Allah gave? If Allah wants, He will take that life away. He has more power than you and I. Subhanallah. So Al-Khidr says, look, you don't know what I've done. Just leave it. It was from Allah inspired. Subhanallah. And then he explains that had this child grown older, he would have been a source of misfortune for his parents and a source of sadness, a source of perhaps harm to his parents. Therefore, Allah chose to take him away at an early age to avoid his parents suffering and him to actually end in a bad way. So it was the blessing of Allah. What I learned from this, the biggest lesson is Allah knows that which was never going to happen. Because Allah knew that this child is going to go now. But Allah knew if we gave him life, which we were not going to do anyway. But if we did it, he would have turned out to be X, Y, and Z. That's the knowledge of Allah. So if you did not come here today, where you would have been, Allah knows. But Allah also knew that you were going to come here. It is so amazing that sometimes it confuses the mind. You need to sit and think about it. You need to sit and think. That's the knowledge of Allah. He is the owner of all knowledge. So when Allah says, I created you to test you, what did he say? Testing about what? He says, to test you who from amongst you has better deeds. To test you who from amongst you has better deeds. That's all. Allah says, I created death and life in order to test you who has better deeds. Which means, I need to work as best as I can to please Allah. In the meantime, there will be, you know, when there is a test, what happens? What happens in a test? You go into your exam room, and you are tested mathematics. So do they just test you what you want? Everything will be nice, smooth, sweet, calm. No, you will work hard. You will go into the exam room at the right time, with the right uniform, at the, in the right place, sitting in the correct position, making sure that you don't copy, you don't cheat. You are looking at your paper. You are praying that it's going to be easy. You are praying that it's going to be easy. And you start answering. The first question, one plus one, mashallah. You know the answer, two. Very easy, right? It is so easy that if you were asked that question for O or A levels, you might think there is a catch here. You might think there is a catch. Imagine you come for your examination O level. First question, one plus one. You just look at each other. Like when MC almost gave away my date of birth. First time in my life I've seen someone, mashallah, may Allah forgive us all, who introduces a speaker with his date of birth, I almost choked, mashallah. <laughs> MashaAllah, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Just as well he didn't give the year. <laughs> but I can let you in on a secret. I can let you in on a beautiful secret. I have, and my colleagues do know this, I have two of my daughters are actually married. So you can guess how old I am, inshallah, just as well. And that's not a lie, that's, a, that's the truth. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. If you were to enter an exam and you hear something that is quite simple, you will be a little bit confused to say, how come this is so easy? Allah says, in life, we will test you with ease. It's a test. When we give you, it's a test. When we take away from you, it's a test. Everyone, now, now I'm getting to my topic, okay? Everyone and everything that we have put around you is part of your test. You have snakes as your test. You have giraffes as your test. You have kittens and cats that you may choose to be your pets as snakes. You may have birds as pets as snakes. Those which are, sorry, as, as, as uh, a test. You may have that which is 
harmful as a test, that which is beneficial as a test. All these are tests from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your brothers were chosen by Allah as a test for you. Your sisters chosen by Allah. You did not choose who's going to be your brother or sister. So much so you did not choose your father or your mother. That's your test. Why? Because Allah created you different from everything and everyone. You are unique. You are you. You are so different that your thumbprint, your iris print will be completely different even from your own mother and father. What are you going to do about it? So now let me take you to the exam room again. When you are asked a question, you will be asked addition. This is a mathematics exam. After addition, do they say, fine, you passed? No, they will test you with subtraction. Okay, what is one minus one? Why subtraction? Because now we need to know whether you have mastered that subject, right? So Allah tests you by giving you. After a little while, what does he do? He takes away from you. He tests you again. How did he test me? He took it away. What did he take away? Something I loved, gone. Allahu Akbar. What do we say when we lose a loved one? May Allah give them Jannatul Firdaus. We say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Have you ever pondered to think what it means? I don't know if you have the same crisis we have in other parts of the world. You hear someone, they say, Oh, brother Musa passed away. And everyone says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. But they didn't think what they're saying. It's just a statement that came out of the mouth. You haven't thought what is the meaning of what I just said. It means we all actually do belong to Allah and we're all going to go back to him. Not just the one who passed away, but all of us are going to go there. It's a reminder to all of us to say, I'm also going there. That's what we actually say when someone passes away. Don't we use that as a dua, right? Next time, think about what you're saying. Don't just pay lip service to it. And this is the difficulty when we convert our religion and faith into a ceremony your salah your prayer is not a ceremony nor is it a performance it is actually a fulfillment that's what it is and for that reason i prefer to use the word fulfill your salah although it may not be wrong to say we are performing salah but for me salah is not a mere performance i would rather say i'm fulfilling my prayer the point i'm raising is allah tests you by taking away then Allah tests you by multiplying. Then Allah tests you in all the different ways, just like an examination. When I was much younger, I recall, and probably it still happens now, on television, on television, they used to have obstacles for children. And they show it to you on the TV and you win a prize. Two teams and you have to do certain obstacles in order to get to the other side. Whoever gets there first is the winner. And they get so many more crystals or they get so many more stars. And at the end of the day, the people who have the most stars, they are the ones who win. Now that I'm much older, I sit and think, do you know, your whole life works in a similar way. Your whole life works in a similar way. You enter the obstacle, you find water. What do you have to do? You have to get across to the other side. What will happen as you are trying to get across? A crocodile will come from underneath. It will try to snap at you, right? You have to do, make a plan, do something, get a rope at the top and go to the other side or build a bridge. You build a bridge so that the crocodile does not bite you. And then what happens? When you get to the other side, you have one crystal, you hold it. Now you're excited, you cannot stop there, you get to the other crystal. After a while, when you go to the other side, there is a snake. Why did they put snakes? Why? To show you that the obstacle is what makes you the winner. When you go beyond the obstacle that is placed in your life, you are the winner. Every one of us, without a single exception, will have obstacles. And those are the matters, the issues that will actually shine us. You are known not during your glory days, not during your days of glory, but during your difficult days. Are you still a faithful person? Are you still a humble person? Do you still have faith in Allah? Are you still a good person? In fact, with us, even when we are given, we are tested by Allah. Do you still remain humble? Are you still a person who is approachable? Are you still the person who has developed himself or herself even more now that Allah has given you more? So all this diversity that we see around us is created different from us. In order for us to be tested, what is going to be my relationship with that which is different from me. When I see, I'm going to give you one of the worst examples. It's okay, inshallah, don't worry. 
When I see a pig, when I see a pig on the road, or when I see a pig somewhere in the garden or in the bush, in the bush, okay? What is my duty towards the pig? Are you allowed to consume a pig? No. Are you allowed to deal with it? No. Can you just say, right, pig, haram to consume, dirty animal, I'm going to kill it. Can you say that? Never. Why? Allah gave that pig life. Who are you to harm it? When Allah says, don't eat it, don't eat it. Did Allah say, when you see a pig, harm it? Is that what he said? No. Who gives you the right to take that life away? If Allah wanted, he would not have made the pig. Can't you understand the power of Allah? Allah is powerful. If he wants to take the life of someone, he would take it away and he has. Why should I cut it short? Who gave me the right and authority to harm someone or something that Allah has made? So much so that these trees you see around us, they are living. Did you know that? They have life, a different type of life. Perhaps not with the soul that we know, but they have life, they grow. Subhanallah, you do not go around as a Muslim and a true believer destroying the ecosystem and destroying the forest and just bringing down things and contaminating the river or the ocean and thus harming the fish. Subhanallah, you do not do that. I was telling you about the tree just outside my home. Recently, some of you who might be following on Instagram, I thought to myself, I'm going to take a picture of this tree. I did it last year. I'm going to do it again. And I want to say something. Unfortunately, I became very busy. So all I did is I took a little video and put it up for the Insta story, they call it, which lasts about 24 hours. But I didn't say anything. What did I want to say? Let me say it now because it's relevant to our topic. I'm not a tree. I'm very different from a tree. Very different. I'm thankful to Allah that I'm not a tree. But sometimes I sit and I think the tree lives way longer than I do. Trees are out there for hundreds of years at times. And what do they do? They are people who pass, people who are loud, people who are soft, people who are stamping, people who are flying past, people who in trucks, people in cars. The tree doesn't mind, doesn't mind. I'm doing my job. Ignore it. There are birds that come on it. There are birds that may not want to come on it. I don't mind. I will still provide the fruit every year. I will still give the shade. Whoever wants to benefit, let them benefit. I will still continue giving the flowers, meaning blossoming once, twice a year, no matter who comes, who benefits. I will continue doing my job. I'm not worried about what others have to say about me in terms of negativity. I am going to be positive. Wow, I learned a lesson. From what? From a tree. I need to continue blossoming. There will be people who don't like me, just like people who want to chop that tree. I will be a person who continues giving the fruit, just like the tree, no matter what people say about the fruit. I will continue to provide shade, no matter what people say. I'm different, but I must do my goodness. My brothers, my sisters, do not lose your goodness based on someone else's evil. No. Continue to be good no matter what they do. Why should their bad make you a bad person? Remember this. They will be different. They will think differently. They will be different. How many of us have had a difference? Okay, let's try and make it a bit more interesting. Show me with a show of your hands, okay? If you have had a difference with a family member, a difference with a family member, whether it is your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, or your child, if you've had a difference with them, put up your hand. Okay, put them down. That's most of us, mashallah. The rest, I think they are too shy. <laughs> too shy to admit. Or maybe they thought we're talking about fighting and warring, not fighting and warring. Differences. We like different things. We want to eat different things. We want to do different things. We want to go on holiday to Hawaii and they want to go to Honolulu. Subhanallah. Guess what? We will go to the same, to both places, inshallah. Just take an extended vacation. We want to go out to eat here. They want to go out to eat there. We are different. We are thinking different. But I love this person. She's my wife, for example. But we differ. This is my son, but we differ. 
Sometimes the differences are bigger than that. I've known of homes, people who are not Muslim. Suddenly one child comes up and he becomes a Muslim. Some of you might be in that situation right now. Then he goes to a scholar of Islam and says, what should I do? Now you get different answers because it's based on the knowledge. It's also based on the expertise and experience. And if you have been through that situation or lived through it or helped people, you will understand it more. Some will say, haram, get out of your house. These people are kuffar. They are dirty. You get right out, move. You can't have, where is he going to go? Where are you chasing this man or this woman? Are you okay in your mind? What have you just said? These are human beings. You may want to talk and discuss. I believe I belong in this faith here. I respect your faith. I used to belong to this faith for so many years. I respect it and I will always respect it. But I have chosen something else. I just want you to cater for me and I will cater for you. So I need this area as my prayer area, for example, which I will use once or twice in the day, depending on the size of the house, the conditions you are living in, you have to take everything into consideration. I would like to eat in a specific way. They may never agree for you to say the fridge should only have that which is halal. Although some families would do that. I'm talking of a specific situation. The brother or the sister may not be wealthy to actually go and do their own thing. You have to understand we will be different in that case, but we will respect each other. And the same applies to other cases. I give an example. I gave it yesterday. I'm going to give it to you again today, worded slightly differently. A lot of us have businesses. A lot of us have things we like to market, a product that we want to sell. Okay? We have customers who are not Muslim. Do you agree? Do you agree? We have customers who are not Muslim. I want to ask you a question. What is more important, deen or dunya? Deen, right? Okay. Deen is more important, which means your faith, your religion is more important than your life, your, your living, for example, right? Your faith. So your faith is more important. For dunya, you are ready to compromise and to live together and to set aside your differences and respect your differences because this man, this woman who belongs to a different faith or who belongs to no faith at all would like to purchase your product and that is an important person as a customer. You will treat them well, you will respect them, you will greet them, you will acknowledge them, you might even invite them for a meal, you might treat them and give them a gift once in a while because they are your customer your client regarding dunya, a product. Don't you think you should be even more than all of that put together when it comes to something much more important and that is deen. That is deen. The deen is a product which we need to market. The only way of marketing it is if we were to fulfill the method of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam when he marketed the deen right at the beginning. Marketing is called da'wah. Do you agree? Subhanallah. How do I do da'wah? I have to interact. I have to mix. I have to greet. I have to talk. I have to acknowledge. I might want to exchange gifts. These are human beings. They are different from you. But you need to know how to build the bridge. You need to know, going back to the sunnah of Muhammad wasallam, you cannot divorce yourself completely because that would mean that you don't have a concern for the rest of humanity. Imagine if people were divorced completely from those whom they differed with, we would probably not be Muslims. Because maybe they wouldn't have interacted with us or our forefathers or whoever accepted Islam. So we need to be realistic about these things. You cannot just think to yourself, you know what? That's it. If I'm different from someone, I'm not going to interact with them. If that's the case, you will lead a very, very lonely life. Because you will realize very soon that you differ from everyone. Everyone, including your spouse. How many people today, we have a sickness? What is the sickness? The sickness is we are not prepared to build bridges. We are not prepared to mend relations. But we are rather prepared to break a relation based on something minor. So 
when people get married before mashallah we used to say alhamdulillah when are you having kids how many children do you have in two or three years now when people get married maybe not in mombasa i hope it is still good here but in other parts of the world when they get married two years later you say are you still together <laughs> that's the question are you still together i know of hundreds of cases of people who take loans in order to show huge weddings. The wedding was big. The wedding was beautiful, but the marriage was not beautiful. The wedding, we took loans. The divorce happened six months later, but that loan, it will take us two years to pay. So we are paying for a marriage that was already broken before, subhanallah, we've even seen the fruits of anything. We are paying for it way beyond its lifespan. Does it make sense? Why? Because we are not setting aside differences. You marry someone, you will be different. Appreciate the difference. Acknowledge it. Give people their view, their opinions. Understand the same way you have a right. Even regarding belief. You know, I'm a Muslim. Inshallah, I have firm faith. I am quite strict on myself. I try my best to fulfill my prayers on time. I try my best to worship Allah alone. I try my best to protect myself from bid'ah. I try my best to protect myself and I'm quite strict and I'm firm in my belief. I'm convinced that this is the true faith. Guess what? There are others who will not be convinced in the same way that you are. They will be convinced about something different from you. Some will be convinced completely that Christianity is the true way of life. They are convinced. They have a brain, they have eyes, they have ears, they have studied. And according to their studies, that is the way. What do I do? Do I harm them? Do I attack them? Do I swear them? Do I insult them? We are different. No, I don't. I treat them fairly and I expect fair treatment from them. I will discuss with them wherever I can. I will market my product and guess what? They will market their product to me too. I need to know my religion enough to be able to answer questions. Many of us are Muslims. Wallahi, we don't know enough of our religion. So when people ask one, two, three questions, we say, no, no, no. You are bad. You are ugly. You are this and you are that. You cannot do that, my brothers and my sisters. You cannot do that. You need to understand Allah has kept it such that yes, you will do what is known as da'wah. You will invite people to the true path that you are convinced regarding. They will agree or disagree. Look at what Allah says to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. مَا عَلَى الرَّسُولِ إِلَّا الْبَلَاغِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ مَا تُبْدُونَ وَمَا تَكْتُمُونَ The duty of the messenger is to convey the message clearly. Al-Balagh. In another verse, Allah says, Al-Balagh al-Mubeen. The duty of the messenger is to convey the message clearly. Allah is the one who decides whom he will guide, who will not. Allah knows what is inside and concealed and what is apparent. Allah knows what is open and what is hidden. That is Allah. So the duty of the messenger, the prophet of Allah, the best of creation, the most noble of all prophets, his duty was to convey the message. That was his duty. He conveyed it. Those who accepted, accepted. Those who did not, did not. They are answerable to Allah. Allah has kept a day of judgment to judge. Look at the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What happened? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sad that this uncle of mine is rejecting the message. He knows it is true, but because of his circle of friends, because of the people of Makkah and the cronies and the chiefs, he wanted to mix with them and mingle and he did not want them to think that he gave up the faith of his forefathers even though he knew inside that I cannot worship sticks and stones. You know what? The Prophet ﷺ was saddened. He says, Ya Ammi, Qul kalimatan uhajju laka biha yawm al -qiyamah. Oh my uncle, say the statement, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Say it and I will fight your battle on the day of judgment. The uncle did not say it. According to verses of the Quran, Allah revealed verses saying, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ 
ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء you oh muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not guide whomsoever you wish but rather we are the ones who guide we are the ones who guide allah says guidance is in our hands don't be saddened that's allah our duty towards those we are different from is to discuss the matter to raise the issue if it is a matter that is not of importance don't even raise it it's not of importance some of these things that i might have mentioned earlier on regarding your spouse or your children a lot of it is not even worth mentioning you make an issue out of it you destroy a relationship for nothing people destroy their relationships based on what color motor vehicle we purchased hey we've got a car others don't even have a car thank allah you want a blue vehicle and she wants a red vehicle paint half of it blue and half of it pink if you want red that's a petty issue how can you divorce over the color of your vehicle that's what people are doing you might differ when building a home or a house or when shifting into a house regarding a few details don't worry have a big heart my brothers and sisters accommodate people allah will accommodate you remember that accommodate people too many marriages are breaking too many houses are breaking too many brothers are not speaking to each other for decades based on material based on money based on something that you can really do without based on something that you are not going to be questioned about in your grave give it up don't worry sometimes we make money when we did not have the money we had more love when we have the money we become distant why because your love for your wealth has become more than your love for others who are your family members and human beings of the same species so what did allah say allah says the minute you make more than a certain amount zakat is farad why reach out to those who don't have what we gave you so that you can be appreciated even by them that is why the most loved people are the most charitable people do you know that and allah says charity is not only monetary it is also through the expression on your face people of mombasa don't just look at me smile <laughs> smile it's an ibadah engage in the ibadah the expression on your face boosts you wallahi it boosts you mashallah you know my teeth are not straight no one notices because you just smile that's it they just see the smile they don't notice these teeth are all al not aligned even my children tell me dad you need railway tracks <laughs> and i say i don't think i do you people who are young you've become too conscious my nose is bent my eyes are like this my face is like this this side is more than that no one ever notices it you are looking too much in the mirror crack all of these mirrors and throw them out enjoy what allah has created allah made us different for us to enjoy the earth imagine if there were no reptiles there were no lions because they are harmful there were no cheetahs and no snakes and there were no crocodiles or reptiles life would be boring honestly and kenya wouldn't make that much money by the way <laughs> but allah has blessed you you have everything mashallah tabarakallah you have everything it's beautiful you call people who haven't seen the elephant to come and see what the elephant is all about the big five mashallah they will come and see allah's made it we what do we do with those animals we actually fulfill their rights as far as we can we appreciate we don't want to destroy and become destructive but we seize the opportunity of growth through those differences that we have don't you think human beings are far more important subhanallah human beings are far more important the man you don't get along with i don't want to say mother in law but the person you don't get along with is not a reptile they are not crocodiles they are not lions that's a human being set aside your differences talk to each other make life easy for someone allah will make life easy for you imagine the hadith says man nafasa an muslimin qurbatan min qurab ad-dunya nafasa allah anhu qurbatan min qurab yawm al-qiyamah one hadith whoever makes whoever eases the difficulty of another uh, in this dunya allah will create ease for them in the akhirah and in another narration in this world and the next and another narration speaks about humanity at large la yarhamillahu man la yarhamin nas 
irhamu man fil ardi yarhamkum man fis sama the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says have mercy upon those on earth he didn't specify have mercy only on the muslims have mercy only on this have mercy no irhamu man fil ardi have mercy upon those on earth and the one in the heavens will have mercy upon you ask yourself am i merciful am i merciful to my brothers my sisters my parents my children my in-laws whether they be daughter in law son in law mother in law father in law whoever else am i merciful towards these people if i am then alhamdulillah if i am not you need to build the bridge if you don't how are you going to cross into jannah you need a bridge to cross into paradise it is as-sirat we hear about it in the hadith we've read about it in the quran yes it is of a different nature but your living on earth will determine in which manner you will cross that bridge some will cross it like a flash some will struggle on it some will drop into jahannam do we want that to happen to us no so learn to build your bridges here and allah will help you cross that bridge there we are living the test that i was speaking about collect as many crystals as you can you will get to jannah don't worry about how much the other man has collected you collect them every opportunity do good reach out to people be the best you can fulfill both rights the right of allah and the right of the creatures of the same allah and that brings me to a very interesting point everything you see around you was created by allah he who created you it belongs to him the earth belongs to him the heavens belong to him not to you you belong to him subhanallah so whatever you see tell yourself allah is testing me how is my relation with all these things the road that you are driving on honor it respect it you know what the hadith says ittaqul la'anaini qila wa man la'anani ya rasul allah qal الذي يتخلى في طريق الناس أو في ظلهم. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says, be careful of the two who are cursed. So the Sahaba asked, and what are these two, or who are the two who will be cursed? What are the two things that would be making people become cursed? Or who are the two cursed people? He says, the one. Listen carefully. The one who relieves himself on the path of the people or in the shade where the people achieve shade from. How come? Because you are harming the other creatures of Allah. You are harming the other creatures of Allah. Imagine people urinate under a tree and they think it's okay. Someone wants to come and have a picnic, mashallah, romantic moment. They lay down their little carpet, mashallah. I hope you do it, guys, inshallah. <laughs> and suddenly you say, oh, it's smelling here. What's going on? Automatically, the one who made it smell was wrong he should have chosen a better place look at the cats look at the dogs when they want to relieve themselves a lot of the times they will choose the place they will dig a little hole they will make sure that they have covered it in most cases those are dogs and cats what about us shouldn't we be better than that if the hadith goes as far as looking after the places where people might benefit from the shade who are we to harm people physically when Allah says you're not allowed to harm them with the smell? Look at the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ speaks about those who remove a harmful object from the path of the people have shown that they are true believers in Allah because it is a part of belief. Imatatul adha an tariq min al iman. Part of your iman is to remove a harmful object. When you are driving, when you are walking, you see a rock in the ro on the road, you swerved and you missed it, mashallah. What should you do if you are a true believer? If you really have iman, you should think for a moment, let me collect my crystal. How do I do it? I park my car, make sure the traffic is in order. I don't want anyone to bump me, but I will pick up this rock only and solely for the sake of Allah. That is your crystal. I picked it up and I threw it away on the side in such a way that whoever passes this road my friend my not my friend muslim not muslim whoever they are they will not be harmed by that rock i'm sure you've heard that this is part of iman have you heard about it look we are nodding our heads yes we have 
Now why don't we think that the same Allah who is telling us that part of your Iman is to remove a rock from the road so that others are not harmed by it. Do you think that that Allah would tell you to harm other people physically and say you are a good Muslim? That's what people are doing. In the name of Islam, they are killing. In the name of Islam, they are destroying who? Other Muslims. People who might differ with you in sect. People who might differ with you in faith. My brother, don't be a coward. My sister, it is a sign of your own weakness because you are supposed to be so powerful in your mind and your knowledge that you know what I have is so convincing. When I talk to them two times, three times, at least they will acknowledge that we are good people. When you talk to the non-Muslims, my aim is not to revert them or to convert them. No, my aim is not to do that. I will deliver the message. It's up to Allah what happens. But I do know when I deliver the message, even the staunchest non-Muslims who dislike Islam, they will have to nod their heads and say, well done, it's a good religion. I acknowledge you guys have some good teachings. Isn't it about time we did that? We have to, we must. We interact with people every day. Like I said, for dunya, please remember to interact with people for deen. It's more important. If you have tolerated your differences for dunya, remember you have a bigger responsibility to tolerate them in a bigger fashion for your deen. The product of deen is far more important than any product of the dunya that you might want to market to them. Remember this. And this is why it's important for us to understand our rights, to understand our duties towards one another, no matter who we are. Look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he arrived in Medina Munawwara, one of the first things he did was he struck a treaty. With whom? With those who don't belong to our faith. Who are they? The Jews who were in Medina Munawwara, the people of the book. He called them and he wrote a proper treaty. Please go back to the books of Sirah and check what was written there. You will be shocked at the way people are calling themselves followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam today and harming those whom they disagree with. When we are talking of the Jewish people of Medina Munawwara whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam struck an agreement with. And he spoke about their rights. We will defend you. We will ensure whatever we have for ourselves, you have the same rights, etc., etc. Yes, they might have broken the treaty later on, but the point being raised is there was a treaty in place. Later on, there was the Treaty of Hudaybia. Have you seen it? What was it? What was the benefit of the Treaty of Hudaybia? Can I tell you some of the benefits? You will have to go back and look at what the treaty was all about. When the Sahaba radiallahu anhum felt, Oh Messenger, is this fair? Is it fair? You know, there were some clauses in the treaty that looked like they were against the Muslims. But the Prophet sallallahu obviously from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed revelation. This was what was meant to be done. It was done. No mistakes in it. As a result, Islam spread far and wide. The opportunity arose for that message to be delivered going all over. Subhanallah. So the point being raised, my brothers and sisters, remember yesterday in, Mom, in Nairobi, I spoke about mending relations. And I felt the message was more for me than anyone else. Today, I've touched a little bit about differences and the fact that we need to enjoy. We need to, we need to understand. Appreciate is the word. Appreciate the differences. Acknowledge them. You know, I've come across young people who come to me and say, I'm not feeling well. Why? Because they, this person or someone else told me that you're ugly and you're this. And, and I always tell them you're not. You're absolutely stunning. But it needs the right eyes. That's all. It needs the right heart. None of us is ugly. None of us is thrown out of the mercy of Allah. Every one of us is within the mercy of Allah. No matter what you look like, no matter what your complexion is, no matter what your size is, Allah has created us so diverse that someone somewhere will really look at you and die to be with you. Subhanallah. Literally. And the reason I say this is we have a different taste. You find sometimes, you know, some people might look somewhere and say, Oh, wow, did you see this? Look at how good. And someone else will say, What, what are you looking at? 
But that's how Allah has made us. So appreciate that. Thank Allah. No matter who you are, there will be people who are crazy about you. Why? It's Allah's method. It's Allah's way. Allah made us different. And that's why, have you thought about it? Do you know what I learned? I learned that if you shave your head, the way your hair grows, is totally unique. You can actually in future have, I don't know what do they want to call it, a hair print? <laughs> you know, for recognition, we have the iris, unique. We have, for example, the thumbprint, unique. Everything is unique. Did you know that there are no two zebras on earth that have the same stripes? You would know because you are from Kenya, right? No two zebras have the same stripes. No two leopards have the same spots. This is the creation of Allah. Show me what those besides Allah have created. That's the creation of Allah. Allah challenges us. He is the proud. He is the one who says, look, I made this. Show me what others have made. All of you have a different identity. You know what is DNA? I'm sure you've heard it, but go and read about it. Go and research. You will be shocked. Wallahi. I gave a little bit of saliva for a DNA test of my own to find out. Sorry, this, this is telling us the time is up, but it's okay. <laughs> to find out more about myself, who am I, where I come from. And they gave me back 15 generations where you are from. DNA. What was it? little bit of saliva in a small little spittoon. Wow. Me, unique me. They will tell me who I'm related to, who I'm not related to. You know, they won't say which microphone is working and which is not, but that's fine, inshallah. But my brothers and sisters, don't you think it's amazing? It's the creation of Allah. We are different, totally different. We will appreciate those differences. We will acknowledge them. Really. And we will enjoy the fact that we are different, unique. Look at your features, thank Allah. Look at the others, thank Allah. But remember, it's a test. The minute anyone thinks they are better than the other because of what Allah has given them, that is the very minute that they have dropped all their crystals. Sometimes you collect a bag of crystals. You know what the crystals are. I was speaking about them from the beginning, right? You collected a whole bag, but because of one big thing, you dropped the whole bag. Let me show you. لا فضل لعربي على عجمي ولا لعجمي على عربي ولا لأبيض على أسود إلا بالتقوى. You heard that hadith before? No virtue of an Arab over a non-Arab or a white over a black or vice versa except by taqwa. The minute you think because my complexion is lighter or darker or because I belong to this tribe or because I belong to this particular uh, nationality or because I am this or I am that that I am better that's the same minute you have dropped your crystals. Your whole bag is dropped. Why? Because now you have kibr, pride. What is that pride? لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال حبة من خردل من كبر. You will not enter Jannah. He will not enter Jannah in whose heart there is a mustard seed's weight worth of pride. You need to deal with it. You need to deal with the pride. Remember, you are just a number. Everyone else is like you trying to please Allah. Yesterday when we walked out of that particular venue we had, which was so beautiful, I saw many brothers and sisters walking and they were going towards where the public transport was. And wallahi, in my heart, and I even told some of those who were with me, look at these people. They all want to please Allah. Everyone wants to please Allah. If you don't feel the love in your heart for one another, you are sick. You are sick. Wallahi, you need help. If you think you are the only Muslim on earth, you are the only one, you are sick. They are, Jannah is very broad. It is huge. It's not just for you. I, I listen to people who think that because they differ with others, the others are not going to go to Jannah at all. You know what? They say these people will not go to Jannah. Those say these people will not go to Jannah. A third party says both of you are not going to Jannah. A fourth one says all three of you are not going to Jannah and it continues. And I sit and I think, wait, Jannah is going to be empty, man. There's no one there. No one there. If Jannah was according to you and your mercy, truly it would be empty. But it is not yours. It belongs to Allah. And you know who is Allah? The most merciful, the most forgiving. 
وَإِنِّي لَغَفَّارٌ لِمَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا ثُمَّ اهْتَدَى Allah says, I will continue forgiving. You know what is ghaffar? Ghaffar means one who continually forgives. Not ghafur. Ghafur also is someone who forgives. But ghaffar is mubalagha. It is something, it is the, in the Arabic language, it shows that this quality is repeated so much. Allah forgives you once, twice, ten times, twenty times, hundred times for as long as you are seeking forgiveness. Man taba taba Allahu alayhi. Whoever seeks forgiveness, Allah will forgive him. Until the point, in Allah yaqbilu tawbat al abdi ma lam yugharqir. Allah continues to forgive his slaves for as long as they have not arrived at the point of death. When the gharghara comes, it's called gharghara. When your soul gets to your throat and it's about to be removed from your body, that is the time it's too late. Up to that point, you will be forgiven so many times. So who are we looking at others and saying, you know what? This one is going to Jahannam. Sorry, I'm just pointing at the, at the glass there. No one in particular. <laughs> that one's going to Jahannam. This one's going to Jahannam, etc., etc. We don't know how we are going to end and how they are going to end. I know of a pop star. A guy who spent his time in the nightclubs. A guy who spent his time, his time singing and dancing with naked people and nudity and whatever else there was. And guess what? One day, one day, he decided to quit all of this. He came into a pure life. And you know what happened to him? Subhanallah. He became so relevant in terms of the deen because people watched him. And they were like, ah, you mean you quit your whole life in order to come here? Are you crazy? You know, people think when you become a sheikh, you are crazy, you are mad. You know, you rather have stayed in the, the life of limelight. That's not true. The limelight is not what is important. What is important is the light of the path. You need to tread the path. So this man became so famous and he used whatever Allah gave him in terms of capacity to spread good. Yet he himself says there were people who used to say he's going to Jahannam a long time back. People used to say this man totally out going to hell. And there were people who were pious who went back that way and him, he came this way here and guess what? There was a time when he passed away. And I promise you his janaza was attended not by 1,000, not by 10,000, not by 100,000, but hundreds of thousands. And his time was very short on earth, very short. You wonder what was the purpose of this person on earth? And then you realize, subhanallah, Allah is showing you, don't judge people. He used to say himself, this person I'm talking about, he used to say himself, please, when you see children in the nightclubs, have hope, work on them, try with them, reach out to them, because I used to be there. When you see children on drugs, and that is a problem across the globe, drugs has overtaken the whole world. Pray for them, work on them, have hope with them, try with them, keep on trying. Someone might say, well, when do I give up? You don't give up until you die. Don't drop your crystals, have hope, keep trying. They just need one day when they might drop all their bad habits. Trust me, they will be better than you. Imagine a person doing a lot of bad and suddenly they do a lot of good. They use all the energy they used to use for bad, for good. Because you help them, you get a full reward for that. But we are too lazy. We just want to harm, we want to kill, we want to fight, we want to destroy. That is not Islam, that's not the sign of a Muslim. I don't know how I'm going to end, just like I don't know how you are going to end. I have hope for myself and I have hope for yourself. And the winners are those who want to take as many people as possible to Jannah. That was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Do you know the kuffar of Quraysh? He used to go to them. He used to talk to them. He used to try with them. And many of them accepted Islam. Subhanallah. They accepted Islam. Some of them didn't. But a lot of them did. He had hope. He kept trying. He wanted to take maximum number. When the people of Ta'if were about to be crushed by the angels waiting for one instruction. That instruction did not come. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He just says, if they don't accept, inshallah their offspring will accept. What happened? A few years later, there was a victory. They accepted Islam. Let's be patient. My brothers and sisters, 
we need to be patient in order for us to be able to build bridges we have to be very patient we have to be very forgiving we have to be very understanding we have to be very accommodating not just tolerance tolerance is no longer a good word now we go beyond tolerance to respect we respect the difference remember this we used to say we, we tolerate each other. Do you know what's the meaning of tolerate? Have you thought of it? Tolerate means I really don't like you. I really don't agree with you. I don't even want to talk to you. You are such an enemy of mine, but I'm going to tolerate you. I'll tolerate the fact. You use the word tolerance to say I'm on edge, but I'm just tolerating. That's what tolerance is. We've got to go beyond that. I respect you. We differ. Let's talk about it. Don't think for a moment that I am saying don't do dawah. Don't propagate. Don't call. No, I didn't say that. I am saying you will propagate respectfully. And you have to understand the right you have. The others have it as well. They are also living on earth. They are citizens perhaps of the same land. They have equal rights. You might think you are superior because of your faith. They will also think they are superior because of their faith. But that superiority is not necessarily with humanity rather because you believe something they have the right to believe I want to end with one point just came to my mind now I was sitting one day on an aircraft the guy was talking to me about faith because he asked me oh you look like a religious man and so on he says you know what your religion is very bad I told him what do you believe in he says I'm just a free thinker I don't believe in anything so I said when you die what happens he says nothing nothing happens you just go back I said wait he says nothing you become whatever you were before I said you believe something you are believing something anyway the discussion ended how he started asking me about Muslims and he said you people are horrible I said why because you believe that anyone who's not a Muslim is going to go to hell I said hang on hang on hang on are you familiar with Christianity? He said, yes. I said, they have a belief similar to that. Are you familiar with Judaism? He said, yes. They have a belief similar to that. Why are you picking on me? You shouldn't even be talking because you don't even believe in the hereafter. He just looked at me. He said, what? <laughs> you just told me you don't believe. Why are you so worried about whether I believe you are in heaven or hell? Heaven or hell? Why are you so worried about it? You don't even believe, so leave it alone. Subhanallah, that is something that some people pick on sometimes. How can you believe people are going to hell? I'm going to tell them, look, you know what? The Bible has verses, the Torah has verses, the Quran has verses. These verses are in their place. You talk to a Christian, he'll give you similar lines. You talk to a Muslim, they'll give you similar lines. You talk to a Jew Jewish person, similar lines. You talk to people of many faiths, they'll give you similar lines. If you don't follow what I follow, for example, I don't think there's much chance for you. But that is what everyone believes. However, it does not justify you to do bad to someone because you, you need to know your heaven is determined by how you are going to treat the very creatures of Allah that have differed with you. They have differed with you. How did you treat them? This is why we talk about differences. We, we will never just have one common faith on earth. Everybody comes, let's give up half of Islam, give up half of this, half of that, and come and create one huge universal faith which is just all about hello and how are you. No, people are passionate about their faith. We want to pray five times. Nothing will stop us from praying. I believe if you don't pray, you are wrong. So, it's okay. But I will not harm you. I will not hurt you. I will not kill you. All I will do is I will keep on engaging you, talking to you, showing you, and I will market the product I have. What is the product? What I believe is a product. I want to market it to you. Today we are seated here. I've spoken to you. I might have spoken to you in a totally unique way. You might not even have understood why I said what I said. But guess what? The message is loud and clear. I had to market something. What is it? Building bridges. I had to market something. What is it? Mending relations. I had to market something. What is it? Respecting the difference. When we are different from someone, 
Let that never make you harm them or insult them. Because if you do that, you have not understood why Allah chose for there to be differences. Allah is all powerful. If He wanted, there would have been no difference. <laughs> Allah tells us clearly, if we wanted, we could have made all mankind into one ummah. We didn't want that. Why? We wanted to test you. We wanted to test you. What are you going to do? That's Allah saying it clear. Why should we then impose on others what we believe? Keep on talking. You might convince them, alhamdulillah. You may not. Alhamdulillah. It's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in order for you to preserve your faith, you need to know one thing. Learn more about your religion. Learn the truth about your faith and you will be able to save yourself from a lot of negativity, from a lot of harm. You will be able to contribute positively towards building your nation, towards building the ummah and serving humanity at large. Because like I said, there are two things, the service to Allah and the service to the rest of the creatures of the same Allah. I will fulfill the rights of my maker by worshipping none other than him in the way that I was taught by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And I will, serve, I will serve the rest of the creatures of Allah by fulfilling their rights and ensuring that I bag as many crystals as I can up to the day I die. May Allah grant me and all of you Jannatul Firdaus. May Allah gather us again in a good cause, either in the dunya or in Jannatul Firdaus. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So let me confess that strongly I believe this is not the place for me to say anything, especially after what we've heard from our brother Mufti Meng. But I want to acknowledge that I'm probably going to be walking out of that door a transformed Muslim. We all along have been saying that diversity is our strength. We have lived well together. We have coexisted. Cohesion has been the pillar and the strength of our lives. So I am captivated, I am inspired, and I'm looking forward, inshallah, to do much greater things for the Ummah. One lesson that I have learned today is that after all, Islam is about humanity. And I'm even going to have a conversation with my brother Najib and the organizers. Probably we need such summons to be heard more by the non-Muslims because it is very relevant and it makes a lot of sense. So we have discussed with the, my brother Najib and Mufti Meng. He has a very busy schedule. He visits many places around the world. He is a regular in South Africa during Ramadan. But we will do all that we can to secure some two, three, or four days during this Ramadan so that we can engage the society, Mufti Meng, inshallah. It is important. He said many things, and I assure you, I am going to be walking out here a different person. I don't know about you. Really, really. And there are many things that are very positive. You know, Mtihani comes in a different way, the test. But let me end by thanking Mufti Meng for having taken your time to be with us. So what we're looking forward is to a much more bigger event in the near future. Besides that, I want to pray for you as well. May Allah guide you forever and give you Jannatul Firdaus. So all the duas that you made for us, they also must reciprocate and come unto you and your family. So let me not say much. Najib has said it is events such as this one. He's on the other side of the political divide. I am on the other side, but we are brothers at the end of the day, isn't it? So what is ahead of us is La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Shukran. But I want to say, Mufti, it seems you got comfortable on this seat, I could see the passion 
of continuing with your lecture. But unfortunately, he's only here for three days, and tomorrow, inshallah, he'll depart back to Zimbabwe. But finally, I want to say once again to you, Sheikh, thank you very much. It has been very ins inspiring. It has been refreshing. Because sometimes when we hear khutbas elsewhere, it's about Jahannam. <laughs> now we know there is Jahannam, there is also Jannah. And also the way to go to Jannah is more smoother than the way to go to Jahannam. So we want to thank you for that inspiration. I think uh, it is fair to say that we should not dilute the message our brother has given us. I'm really grateful to our brother, uh, brother Meng, for coming out to us in our country and all the wishes my brothers have asked about coming more often to Kenya and probably more to Mombasa.